Welcome back to Up in the Blue Seats, our New York Rangers podcast from the New York Post. I'm going to be taking the lead this week. I'm the Rangers beat reporter for the New York Post, Molly Walker, and I am joined by my co-host, former Rangers great, Brian Boyle. Uh, Larry had to head to practice this morning, so it's just Brian and I this week, and man, do we have plenty to talk about. I wore my Danbury Trashers sweatshirt <laughs> uh, for the occasion. Yeah. I got UMass represented above me for a myriad of reasons. Um, I guess to to start it off, got to kick it off with the with what everybody is thinking about today, and that is the line brawl that broke out off the opening face off between the New York Rangers and the New Jersey Devils. Center ice at the Garden, absolutely electric. Everybody, thank you for telling me I have better vide- videographer skills than TNT. Uh, I was able to catch that entire. Yeah, what? <laughs> what did they do? It was it was a lot. Um, there's Zoom a lot out. to break down here. Yeah, it was. Uh, I had a great view of it, aerial view of everybody. Nice. Got to see each one go back and forth. Uh, I don't even know where to start. I, I think it was really interesting. I don't think anybody, I mean, both coaches said that they didn't think that was going to happen. No. I don't know if I believe it so much. I believe it on Laviolette's side because of how furious he was at Travis Green, the way that he charged to the other side of the bench and screaming at Travis Green from the other. I, I mean, I don't think Laviolette wanted to lose Miller and Truba there. Uh, that was that was a tough blow, but um, obviously provided for a lot of entertainment. What were your thoughts on it, Brian? Uh, well, if I'm, first of all, if I'm Travis Green, I'd be like, why are you yelling at me? And yeah. I think that's kind of what, what he was said. Like, yeah. Because I don't get it. Um, I would have bet if it was, you know, minus 5,000, I would have bet they were fighting anyways because they had to go first shift. I knew they were going to do it, and they did it. Barkley Goodrill looked like he wanted to go – he took a few strides to get the ball. He did. He did. He was ready to rock. Uh, Lazar and Vise, like they were, they all knew, like they had a plan. And that's probably Gujo being like, hey, look, we're all going. Let's, let's just do this. Yeah, let's this. just, let's just, why, and, why leave all the fun to Rempe? <laughs> well, you know what? It, and, and Rempe had to because I yes. said it, I said it on it till now yesterday. Definitely. Said, this, he has to protect his teammates now because if he, and that's why he had to play. They Definitely. have to finish this now. They have to get it out, get it done now. Not to say that there, something else might not happen down the line. The way he plays, I'm sure that a new situation might develop organically. But what's done is done now with this year. You can, it's been handled. I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if Barkley Goodrow is like, we're, we're doing this too, because let's take a little pressure off the kid. Let's all mm-hmm. kind of get into it. We stick mm-hmm. together. He's a uh, lot's been said about our rookie right winger here. Right. He, you know, he paid his fine. He did his time. He did, you know, and now he's been in mm-hmm. and out a little bit. So uh, good on Goudreau for that. That was kind of awesome. In my opinion, uh, I think maybe fight, maybe fight four, but definitely fight five. We're, we're like, well, we have to go now. And, mm-hmm. and even Igor was like, are we going? Like, yeah. <laughs> are we doing this? And Keandre, was- Keandre is not a fighter. Keandre certainly right not. So I didn't too. know. I didn't know exactly what he was doing after the fight. He uh, gave a little short. I, mean, I, little... I, didn't, love, I didn't love it. I mean, <laughs> Keandre's tall, big boy, but that's not really just just some know, friendly, just some friendly someone else, trash Keandre talking. Was a little different. Yeah. Well, the fight's <laughs> over. When the fight's over, that's what I usually love about it. There's a little respect, even right. with the the second like crowd pump up thing. I thought was. Whatever, I'm nitpicking, but I just it was awesome from he's done that me. after every single one though. Yeah, and, and just a quick at least fine. he's consistent, if nothing but <laughs> a quick one's understandable because there's so much pent up aggression. You can't sleep yeah. the night before that game. No, it, it no is way. awful on the inside. I, I yeah. I'm not I don't envy those guys the day leading up to it. And, and it's let's... not good. It, like it's a, one of the worst feelings you ever have, but and when it's over, it's like elation because you survived. Right. You don't really yeah. feel anything. You, you made it. You survived. Yeah. And and can we just talk about, I, I, mean, I was talking to Chris Kreider about it after the game. And the last time that they had a line brawl like that was the Capitals game, I'm pretty sure, yes. after the Tom Wilson thing. Right. So in that situation, it was a five-on-five line brawl. And 
nobody was ejected. But in this situation, both teams had four players ejected. And, and Chris was telling me he's like, I've never seen anything like that. I, and I just I didn't either. I, I, just... I, I, I was wondering if you could shed some light on why the Wilson brawl didn't have any repercussions like that. But this one did. I know that it was I know VC and Lazar had dropped the gloves first, so they were considered the first ones to go. And that's why they both were injected and everybody else got hit with secondary fighting. Yeah. Um, but I, I was just curious why. What was the difference? Was it just the refs being like, yeah, no, we didn't like that. Everybody yeah, they must the have. Ice? They must have been talked to by the league. Hey, in the, yeah. in the, in, in the instance that this might happen, mm-hmm. I don't like it. I don't like the precedents now. I think it's like it doesn't because, make sense because Rempe and, and McDermott are going like they right. drop their gloves. They're not fighting after they see the other two fight. They were fighting from the beginning. It's not right. a secondary fight. They just right. engaged right. three seconds later. Yes. It's not like a big scrum at the net. A guy fights and then another guy fights comes in. Yeah. A guy grabs mm-hmm. him. There's no third man in. Yeah. Every it was all at one up. time. So yeah. how is that? I, I just I didn't get it. I don't it. like I the didn't... precedence. Yeah. I don't like it because now. In, in the in the. Very few times this actually happens. Yeah, right. They're taking that away. Yeah. And now, you know, they're taking our ball and we can't play anymore. It's kind of like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's enough respect there. There's enough anger and hatred also and respect there when a guy was down and there's no ref around, the guy stopped, mm-hmm. which I was like, thank God, because, and, and maybe it's just a sort of empathy. Like if I was down. Mm-hmm. I hope you'd stop. So there's enough, like, I'm going to try and break your face, but then, you know, you fell. So yeah. Don't want to. Yeah. No, it's at that point. It's like the unwritten rules of fighting. But you you never know. So maybe that's why they want, you know, they want to get rid of it. But in this, the way the game's played now, the players, like, yeah, we're going to see it less and less anyways. Now it's like, the best was, uh, Laviolette's, (laughs) Heath Laviolette said that Fox came over to the bench after everything had settled. And he was like, the 2D got, got ejected, and Laviolette was like, yep, 30 minutes. <laughs> yep, you're playing 30 tonight. <laughs> don't, don't go to overtime. Yeah, right? Oh, God. It was, yeah, and it was funny because, I mean, it was Eric Gustafson's first game back, and it's like, surprise, you're getting a full, a full-on workload. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you've ever been in a, in a line brawl like that. Um gotten jumped <laughs> that's a little different and there was a big pile up uh but no like i'm yeah, talking yeah 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 there was off the opening more... face off like that no not off the opening face off but there was over sean avery kind of <laughs> ladislav smith was trying to get him to fight and aves kind of distracted him and then clocked him with one mm. and it wasn't really a sucker because smid wanted to fight him and then aves might have made it look like he wasn't interested in the fight and then hit him hard with the left i think it was mm. but then he got taken out through the middle, right in the middle at center ice was where we used to go out before they did the renovations. And it was kind of between, sort of between the benches. And I remember Theo Peckham was playing for Edmonton. He was trying to get involved. I grabbed Peckham to not, so he wouldn't run down the tunnel because then it right. would have really gone sideways. <laughs> yeah. And again, this was a different era where guys didn't right. care. And I'm in, yes. I'm in Peckham's ear saying, Hey dude, like you're going to get fined 50 K like we, <laughs> he's going to be in the minors this year again. Like he was a call-up guy. Right. I'm like, this is 50 K you're losing if you go out there. So he just looked at me turn and he just dropped his gloves. Uh, I'm like, oh, I guess we're going. <laughs> yeah. And then Brandon Pruss is fighting Zach Stortini at center ice. Right. Yeah. And so we're fighting. I'm over, I'm like getting I'm pushed over the Edmonton bench. <laughs> um, and I, I think Brian Whitney was on the ice for Edmonton. There were different guys. <laughs> Everybody kind of grabs someone. Yeah, that sounds like a crew of players, first like, of can, all. We, I mean, there's there's highlights of it. And so the best part was like we fought whenever we got separated. And that was I got kicked out of the game. It was in the third period. Mm-hmm. We were winning and I already had a goal. So I was like, this is fine. Yeah, you're fine. And <laughs> we go to commercial, mm-hmm. come back from commercial, Prusty and Stortini are still fighting at center ice. <laughs> Literally did a whole commercial, came back, and they're still going at center ice. It was like and there was, I think there was one other. But. That's great. What about, what about your favorite fight you've ever been a part of? Ever, one you've been in? <laughs> um, I don't know. There are a couple in, there are a couple in youth hockey. There's a couple that I really, 
I, that didn't happen that I really wanted to happen. One was at the end of a Detroit game in the playoffs when I was at Tampa. Mm. Um, I didn't. I mean, I I hated it unless I was mad, and then when I was yeah. mad, I I really did love it. Um, mm-hmm. To a point, and then you just kind of you get over it. It's hard to you know mimic that emotion. The guys that do it a lot are, especially back when I played, were crazy to me because I don't know how you get that jacked up. Right. How about one play. that you? How about one that you witnessed that you were on the bench uh, for? Um, I witnessed Kevin Westgarth and the Miners fight Steve McIntyre too. Just mountains going at it for mountains. About, it was opening day in the Miners, my first full year pro. These two went at it center ice for a minute and a half, throwing mm. bomb. You could hear the punches land. Yeah. And just an epic, epic fight. Um, there's been a lot of them. Prusty had a bunch that were just like. We better get going. This five foot, well, maybe six foot guy, five foot eleven and a half, maybe. <laughs> Just beat up their six foot four guy. Like, let's get going here. He beat up Lucic once. It was unbelievable. Um, yeah, there's a bunch, but <laughs> the games themselves, like, it added to the game. So it added to a playoff series, or it added to like the hatred and the rivalry. And then you remember the games that you played that you won, mm-hmm. and the ones you lost and how it felt. So I mean that. Losing to the Devils in 12 was like, oh, my God, we just – I can't believe that just happened because of all the buildup that year. Mm. It was a good one. It was entertaining as all hell. Awesome. It was – yes, yes, they did. It's – I I like, coming from just a hockey writer standpoint, it really is a shame what happened to the Devils this season. It just – I don't think anybody expected it. I don't think anybody thought that they would be in this spot – at this point in the season well, after last um, season. Yeah, I I I love their offense, but they got rid of a couple D. They lost a guy, a defenseman. And their injury. D is so young. Their D they is so, so young. That too. I mean that's not the... like they have a ton of structure up front. Yeah. They're dynamic up front, but they don't have any structure up front. And the fact that the goaltending issue was not addressed adequately in the offseason is is Still to this day, I think one of the most puzzling what situations. But, but even like, they weren't bad last year. They were pretty good. And you yeah, thought they were going to take a step. Like, look at Ottawa. Yeah, like, Corey <laughs> Schneider. Corey Schneider got me onto this. He goes, they they signed a guy for five million dollars who hasn't four out of the last six years hasn't been above nine hundred save percentage and hasn't played forty games. Yeah. So like, I thought Ottawa did great with getting Corpus Allo, and they they did. That's not good at all. But again, they don't have any kind of. One, two, three, four structure. Like, right. Take Goudreau, for example. He's taken some heat this year because of his whatever. He hasn't scored a ton of goals and he makes mm-hmm. whatever he makes. But like, there's a lot of teams that are on right. that playoff bubble that would love to have that guy. Yeah. He's, he, he, I, I'm right there with you. I think that he gets so much flack for, you know, look, you could, you can argue the, the contract 100%, but, there's a reason that he got that kind of contract is because he is, you know, he's a spine of a team type of deal. Absolutely. Like he's such an important guy and doing things that, that people don't necessarily notice that don't yeah. necessarily get glorified. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a fun one fight night at the garden. How loud was it? It was, it was pretty, it was pretty loud. I think more people were, during the fight like you could just hear people like making comments like exclamations you know like it was just very everybody was just in shock that they were watching this unfold that this was that this was what they were looking at on the ice because i don't i think everybody was waiting for rempy and mcdermott but i don't think anybody thought that it was going to be a full-on chaos (laughs) hansen brothers lime (laughs) roll center ice it was good you know you gotta you gotta love that stuff it was it was a great game, and I mean, for the Rangers, going up 2 nothing, blowing the two-goal lead, losing the lead, uh, and then coming back to score two in the in the third period. Again, Alexi Lafreniere just continues to to score big goals for this team at this time of year. Artemi Panarin also just puck on a string last night, as per usual. Uh, it's it, it's one of those character, character games, I think. Definitely. I mean... You're going to get their best no matter what. And yeah. you're solidified a playoff spot for sure no matter mm-hmm. what. But you watch what the, your five teammates just did. You want to you want to back it up with a win. That showed me a lot about what's inside that room. That was mm-hmm. cool to see. 
And you know what? I get some pushback because of the seasons that, you know, McKinnon is having and McDavid and less with Kucherov because I think Kucherov is just blowing through mm-hmm. the whole yeah. league and he, <laughs> he's got point, but he's 50 points ahead of point. Right. Which is insane. Yeah, I know. If you think uh, about it. <laughs> But I mean, Panarin, who's been more valuable to his team than him? Yeah, like he's just been that guy, yes. and he should be in that conversation. But I mean, yeah, if there's five guys in the conversation, do you add a Roman Yossi? There's six guys because you got Matthews, McKinnon, six, seven guys. Whatever. I'm right there with I you. Think he's, I think he should absolutely get plenty of votes. Don't know if he'll win it just because of the the whole narrative around the league and everybody loving Nate McKinnon for good reason. Because I do too. I even uh, think Matthews has a has a really strong chance for it he too. does and, and marner got hurt and if he gets 70 goals how valuable yeah. is that to his team that's yeah you know has a lot of flaws mm-hmm. but i think mckinnon goes i mean mckinnon has another 100 point score on his line i know exactly because of mckinnon I don't right think so. i mean Rankin no. is pretty right which i wrote about and i remember somebody saying like i love that this is presented as if panarin plays with a bunch of joe schmoes like no that's that's not at all what i was saying but it, look at the point totals Look at the point totals going back yeah. from when he first came to New York. He's always yeah, yeah. carried this team in terms of point production in the regular season. And yes, this is completely isolated from his playoff performance, but the Rangers go nowhere in the regular season without Artemi Panarin. He is the reason why this rebuild was was sped up as as quickly mm-hmm. as it was because they got a he is a game-changing organization shifting player and he has been since he signed in new york and and i think that that also should be taken into consideration leading up to this season that he's had um but yeah that's that's just us on this rangers podcast here i think (laughs) they have one bad playoff you know he He wasn't he he wasn't that great in 2021 22 i know he scored the most important goal of the series that ended your season but Mika, Mika, Mika carried them that season. That that well, you playoff get a lot run. of attention on number ten, ninety three. That's why you need him going. That's why we yes. talked about him so much. That's why he's yes. so polarizing. Yes, you need a one two punch. Yes, you get a one two three punch. That'd be neat too. But we'll see. I mean, at least they have those. They got a number of guys that can. Well, that they can got hurt, a one A and a one B line. Yeah. That if they're both going, this team is going to be hard to stop. Like, if they're Stanley, both they going, win a Stanley Cup. They absolutely can. One hundred percent. I'm right there I, with you. I, I was I was kind of waiting, and I thought I was maybe too close to it. So they give me my predictions: East, West, this and that. And I also mm-hmm. like I don't want to like I've kind of been a mush lately, so I've not said it. But they can absolutely. They are. <laughs> There's three teams in the East that could very well win a Stanley Cup. Mm-hmm. And the way Tampa's mm-hmm. playing now, there might be four. Because I know, no I know. Play. I said that too. I said that too. You can't ever count Tampa out. You just can't, especially at this time of year. It's like something happens, something in their oh, DNA. Like their goalie starts making saves. Yeah, it's they're just always a threat. Always a threat. Their and deadline what, pickups were good. They were. I I like I like the Duclair pickup a lot for yeah, them, he's and good. he's been good for them. He had that speed element, but back to yeah. Panarin, like he. Look what I mean. Troch is Troch is a great player. I didn't know he was going to do this at at this point in his career, and it's everything. Everything he does is is just right on the money. But he's getting production on the on the stat sheet because of a little bit more so because of Panarin, and then he's unlocked. Like if Lafreniere's on the first power play, how many points does he get? Right. That's going to be a discussion next year. Take a shot every, every time you've heard that lot, that sentence spoken. Really? This. I don't. I'm not in it's, the same circles as you are. I'm just, no, I'm I, telling you. It's, but it's, who knows? It, you're not going to, you're not going to switch it. It's a line that's been said a lot since Alexi Lafreniere has come into the league. Well, what if he got top six minutes right away? Oh, what if he was on the first no, power play? No, like, no, yeah. no. Those people are dumb. No top six minutes right away. Didn't deserve it. Yeah, Look, I agree. It's not just like, oh, if he played him more. No, he wasn't there yet. You think people people think coaches are dumb. First of all, I'm going to hand anoint this kid. Here you go. Here's first line minutes at 18 or 19. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, well, the guy that was doing a good job there is now like, what did I I was do? about to say, on the li- then, in the lineup that he's in. And the other players are kind of like, why? Why? Because yeah. uh, we're at practice every day, too. We're we're force feeding this kid this and it's kind of like you don't say anything but then yeah of course so the the coach knows the team knows you have to learn sometimes and 
he wasn't terrible. He was an effective NHL player at 18, 19, 20 years old. Now he's making a difference, and hopefully mm-hmm. then he's dominant. We'll see mm-hmm. if he can be that dominant player. He's not He's not an all-world speed guy. Mm-hmm. You have to think your way through things, and that takes reps. Mm-hmm. He's getting the reps. He's obviously very talented and very smart. He's starting to see where his, his offense is going to come from, how he can exploit defenses and how he can be effective. And he's adding a little edge to his game because he's getting a little older and bigger and stronger. And he's realizing that's part of the NHL. Larry and I were talking about who the best and worst matchups would be for the Rangers in the first round. And, you know, you could chime in here, but I'm thinking that they don't want Tampa. I think they're they, playing Tampa. They, they don't want the Islanders. But Oh, I they think... would roll the Islanders. Listen, I they I would th- dummy no, the Islanders. I, I stink. I think that they would win. I do think that they would win. But that being said, if they have a bad first round and they lose a lead to the Islanders, it could be it could be trouble for them. You have to go through that in the playoffs. Of course you, you have do. Have to have that adversity in the playoffs. Let's see when it happens. It's going to happen. Get through it. You're not going to have easy matchups. I hate the matchup game. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. I don't want to play. Brian's no, like, no, doesn't... I don't want to yeah. play. But I have to because it's my job now. <laughs> what about this match? All right, so go ahead. So who... if, I, if I'm them, I'm like, I don't care. Give me Florida in the first round. We're, okay, well, we're winning this thing. Putting on your media personality hat on. Putting uh, on your. I just put my player. No, on, take, it take it off. Take I'm it off. Take it off. I'm ready. I want to play. Put on. <laughs> Brian was if Brian was between the benches last night of the line brawl, he would have been on there. <laughs> oh, I would have been just no. I you can't wreck the suit. Come on. Uh, then who do you who do you think the Rangers want in the first round? Then any if anyone who finishes eighth because they all stink <laughs> except the Penguins because the Penguins they're going to go on a heater <laughs> <laughs> and then they're going to they're going to make it. That would be a crazy yeah. They, I think they want I think they want to win the East points and get whoever gets no the vi- the vibe that i get is and they've you know you know i feel they like earn that they earn, earn wild card too and, and it, right. it should work out how but it i work also out. feel like it gets to a point especially you know after they clinch you know they're kind of not making a big deal of it you know whatever but then a couple weeks after now they're starting to admit we want to win the division we want to win the conference we want to we want to win the president's trophy for crying out i jonathan 100%. quick jonathan quick said it the other day um he doesn't say anything and exactly which that's a great segue to oh, yeah, the, UMA- the umass product mm-hmm. becoming the winningest american-born goaltender in nhl history 392 wins surpassing ryan miller um just to be Unreal. able to watch jonathan quick do it in a rangers jersey what a what a special what a special thing to get to cover i mean he And just in talking to, I spoke to Ryan Miller, um, just in talking to what Jonathan Quick has met, meant for the goaltending position and what he's done with the position, the style that he's brought into the league. It's truly fascinating to hear because I also, I look at, I look at Jonathan and I look at Igor and when you watch them play, they're so different, but they're both so good. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it's just too starkly different styles methodical and technical and then there's like chaotic and and just pure athleticism and it it just the the difference is is so interesting um but big congratulations to jonathan quick stick taps for him and and i was i was wondering brian just if you had any jonathan quick stories or, or anything from playing against him um anything that you can remember I beat him a few times. Mm-hmm. I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, I beat him a few times. Uh, no, we had fun. We had fun at development camps and training camps together. Yeah. And we were just starting out. Um, you know, it had been a while because then he, you know, he took off in LA. He would come home in the summer. He'd play in these charity tournaments, hockey mm-hmm. tournaments, and stuff. It was always a, he's always just a great dude to hang around with. And I had some buddies that played at UMass that are from my area here that you know, has some good stories about him. They're all the same. He's, he doesn't change. He's the same guy. Always has been. Um, he, he does. Th- there are a lot of goalies now that are not fun to watch. Like just get right. back there and make the save. Yeah. You know, I grew up with Patty Wah and, mm-hmm. you know, even Berdor who was 
acrobatic and played the puck a lot. Dominic yeah. Ashick was my favorite guy to watch. He was he was electric. Um, mm-hmm. Now it's a lot of positional blocking. And, yeah, you know, it's Igor, very technical. Yeah, Igor's got some acrobatics, and but Johnny Quick is like a he's explosive. It's like, an, you don't it's describe an, a goalie like that. Exactly, it's a roller coaster ride watching well, him. And he kind of like hovers, and you couldn't. How does he make that save pad to pad? He was just yeah. you know, broke my heart in fourteen. Um, <laughs> and everybody else listening to this podcast, <laughs> right? Exactly, but just a competitive dude and a great, a great guy. Teammates love him everywhere. He's no one's ever said anything bad about. Him. Mm-hmm. It's hard to do when you play that long and you get that many cameras in your face every day. Right. So, you know, congratulations to him. I want him to get four hundred. He's got that you know extension that he got, which I was mm-hmm. psyched to see. We had we had Mike Richter on uh, NHL Now yesterday. Mm-hmm. And I saw. We talking, we were talking about him uh, as well there and. It's just so cool with uh, with who they've had in net in New York. You know, you had Jockerman, you had JD, and he was talking about that. And you know, obviously Mike Richter was holy smokes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was electric too, watching him with the Rangers and then with the World Cup team. And then you get Hank, and then you get you know Igor comes in. But like the, the backup, who's the backup? They traded the other backup, Johnny Quick. It's, comes a, it's in. a future oh. Hall of Famer. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't know. We didn't know what we we're gonna get after camp. I know. camp didn't look great. No, Did camp looked look great. Camp camp looked bad. Camp looked really bad, actually. <laughs> and look at him. Like I here's know. why they are in the hunt and I think should win the presence trophy. Yes. Like I agree. that many points from your backup, who was undefeated until maybe the new year. Did he lose? Mm-hmm. In, in uh, he went he went on like a crazy six and oh stretch, something like that, during during a tough time. Yeah, he so he's I, been he's been really important to them, and honestly, talking to I, you you mentioned the term explosive, and that's that's a term that Ryan Miller used uh, when he was just explaining what what makes Jonathan Quick so different, and he was talking about his post integration, which obviously I never played, uh, and and I know, but I found this to be extremely fascinating, and yeah. I think I think people listening will too. You might not, but I think I think it's extremely fascinating because then I went to Jonathan the next day and I was telling him about my conversation with Ryan and I I was like, obviously, I've never played. Can you just explain to me this post integration and kind of where it started and things like that? And you can go read my my piece on it. But he gave me this whole anecdote about defending against the Sedins when he was in LA and how they were some of the best around the net and their two man, three man game around the net and the way Mm -hmm. that they were able to jam the puck in from the sides. And then I, and now I'm watching him and he almost wraps his whole arm around the post. Like just, there is no space for anything to be jammed in. And I, I, not a lot of I don't see that all the time. I just They'll do I, the reverse VH or whatever, and that's how they're yeah. getting beat short side. And but then the way that he's able to explode from one side to the next, and his recovery time to then defend different situations, I think is that's what Ryan said has had such an impact on the modern day goalie and how the position is played now. And I just I found that to be so fascinating, and and just quick hitting me with that Sedin's anecdote that they basically yeah. game planned for these players in LA with the goaltending coach of how to stop them. And it, it, this like technique was born from it. That is now just such a, a signature part of his game and, and, and just goaltending in general. It, I just found it to be so fascinating and it's so cool to get to, to cover Jonathan quick in a, in a New York Rangers Jersey who would have thunk it, you know? unreal good for him what a that i wanted to play for boston at the end of my career no one wanted me but i always wanted to get one year with them um, <laughs> so good for him that he gets to do it and he's embracing it and realizes how special it is and now he gets another year uh, mm-hmm. and adam fox got 300 points yes he did week, that right? was, that whole game was yeah. just chock full of milestones 300 career goals for chris Kreider. right yeah uh it was it was a really special game and what a chaotic game against a, a very a very intentional yeah. coyotes team <laughs> yeah yeah they stuck with it that was they uh, did it was a little ugly i was working that game for msg too it was uh hey whatever you get a goal yeah. you get a goal yeah, yeah. a win's a win a win's yeah, a win arizona you get a goal yeah 
Yeah, I got it was a little dicey, but it was fun. I mean, that was Saturday, right? So mm-hmm. I had to. I'm like, can we just wrap this up? Because I had to drive home. And you had to make sure we were all prepped for the Easter Bunny to come and have eggs uh, the next morning. So it was like, but that was uh. You know, took care of business on our last game of road trip, right? They're getting on the bird, getting back to New York, and then it was a good trip for them. Also beating Colorado. Yeah, and you know what? It was uh, it's a big, big win for Pittsburgh, but it makes sense. It's like that's a yeah. quick turnaround coming back yeah. from that trip. Also, right. I mean, that's that's a that's a good segue into this team will be in trouble if that second line's not going. If that Panera that that game. The Panarin line just had nothing, it, and which yeah. was a rare occurrence for yeah. this entire season. They they have the entire season, but they they just didn't have anything. And I know I think Roslovic scored the the first line had one goal. So it's it kind of mm-hmm. just shows you how dependent they are on their top six for scoring. And when that second line goes cold, it it can be it can be a bit of a of an issue for them. But Penguins Penguins were. You know they were fighting for something that game, and the Rangers. They yeah, they're didn't dead. Really they have anything to fight for? Penguins pretty much can't lose anymore. Yeah, so mm-hmm. they're dead. And I don't know. I don't know how people realize like you're coming back three time zones after a long road trip with some some emotion and some big you know an overtime game against you know who you might see in the Cup Finals mm-hmm. in Colorado, and then you take care of business when you you weren't really doing it, and then the third you finally stepped on their necks in, in Arizona. Takes a lot out of you. Fly back. Think you have a bit of a break. You got Easter Sunday, whatever, and then you got to go right back and play. That's a that, lot. It's, it's a tall really order. Really hard. Not even just like the physical toll that it takes on you. You got to you got to trick yourself to playing at the level emotionally, yeah. Men- mentally, getting yes. yourself up for that. And like that on top of that, like mentally and emotionally, you can't. It's hard, and you're tired. It's kind of mm-hmm. like that's a. There's yeah. no scheduled losses, especially for teams with. Like the Rangers, but that mm-hmm. might have been a scheduled loss. Like this yeah. is really tough. No, I'm I'm right there with you. And and Alexi Lafreniere, first hat trick of his career in Arizona, yeah. first five point night. Yes. It, the Rangers are going to be in good shape if if oh, Alexi Lafreniere that. keeps this this level up. They are going to be in really really good shape if he can if he can be a game changer in the playoffs. If he can consistently and steadily produce for them. They're going to be in really a really good spot. I think if I'm playing against the Rangers, that's my top matchup is going against them. I want to, oh, yeah. I have to if I have to pick a line to shut down, that's just what they've been. And that's what the trend's doing right now. And like you said, if the second line's not going, they're done. That, well, I call them the first line. They go out second or yes. listed second, but they're yes. the top line. That's and, the only reason why we call them the second line. We're just yeah. going off of their line. They're rushes. the top line for yeah. sure. And, and Mika Zibanejad is the number one center. So he, that's why that first line not is. Not this year though. <laughs> like, <laughs> but if I'm Peter Laviolette, yeah, that's our first line is our second line and trying to trick coaches. Into, and it's not going to work in the playoffs because you're prepping for one team. Yes. So if, they're, if they're effective in the playoffs, they're going to get the toughest matchups. You're going to see, you're going to see, if if Laffy has a good playoff, yeah, yeah, lock that guy up for eight years. Yes, no, they're definitely going to be. I mean, no matter what, first line, second line, that Panarin unit is going to be the focal point yep. of any opposition. Um, and that's that's you know that takes us to, I think, part of the reason why Artemi Panarin has had a tough time. I know that there's been a lot made of you know his game not translating to playoff style, which. I don't know about you. I just think that's such like a cop out answer. But I, I think that the attention is on him as well. I think that it's it's a different. There's less space in the playoffs. I mean, him with the puck on a string, it works most times during the regular season. But it's just not. It doesn't come as easily in a playoff setting. Obviously. Yeah, the ice. I say the ice shrinks. Yeah. So that's a good thing. But. So you need to understand his line mates need to understand he's going to play the same way. This is how he plays. So we have to play the same way with, you could add a little physicality. I know Troach is probably going to do that. And, but you need all three to play the same way. He's going to have the puck a lot. So it's going to look a certain way on him if it's not working, Mm. but he needs everybody 
to kind of check their emotions, almost like, yeah, get, get, get up and get excited, but don't let it get the better of you. We still have to play our game. So if you want to go first, first shift for every line and try to blow the doors off them. Yeah. But now let's play with the puck and score goals. Cause that's what mm-hmm. has gotten us here. Mm-hmm. Um, teams that could do that were like Vancouver and 11. They did it all the way up to the end against Boston. They ran into Tim Thomas and they kind of got bullied, but they could still do it. They had enough toughness. The Rangers have enough toughness. So mm-hmm. those guys should be able to play. So it's just good, which will be interesting to see if 73 is on the fourth line right wing. If he's I know. I can't, I can't I wait to see. I think he has to be. And it sucks for Johnny like, Brodzinski because he keeps coming out and he's scoring goals. He's coming out. I know. Goals. I know. What helps everyone on that team? No, that it's going up and down the wall, banging bodies. I know. It's a real, it's a real, it's a real big decision that Peter Laviolette has to make. And I do think, I know that he's said to us that this whole bottom six rotation that he's got going is just a matter of keeping guys fresh and things like that. But I also think that he's trying to see these different bottom six combinations and what's going to work 100%. best for them come April 20th. Like that's that's at the tippy top of the list. And the biggest question mark is whether or not 73 is in there or not. But I, I do think that Honestly, you could go either way. You could have him in there, but the thing the thing that makes me nervous is the sheltered minutes that he's gotten the entire season. You Bring don't want to Yeah, sure, but like you don't you want to be able to roll all four lines. You want to be able you don't want to be worrying about putting this guy out on the ice in certain situations if he can't handle it, you know? So I look at him also as a tool that Laviolette can have in his back pocket to insert into the game when he yeah. sees fit to inject if if it does get to a point where the rangers are losing steam they're losing that spark they literally have a a, a firecracker <laughs> it's waiting in the waiting in the press box you know so i think that that could be used as a tool as well inst- if if they want to go that route instead of having him be part of of the uh of the whole lineup i think I don't know. He keeps getting kicked out, but I think um, <laughs> games he's played. That's has been it good. too. Games he's played has been good. I, yeah. I, no, he has an impact. He he yeah. makes an impact on the game, and that that means something. That counts for something, one hundred percent. But in seven minutes a night, six minutes a night, you know, yeah. if that's all you're comfortable giving with it, giving. Well, him, then you get the overtime, double overtime. You get that. Yeah. It's you know eleven forwards. And yeah, I get that part. I get that part. But you can't think that way. I think you have to think of okay, yeah. how are we gonna win this game, this first period. How are we gonna get a good start? The other and stuff. He's will part come. of it. Yeah. Like, like, they got depth. That's a good thing. Can't yeah. be bad. It'll be really interesting to see. It, it really will. But yeah, this was this was a jam packed episode. It was a fun one. Um, yeah. Coming up next on Up in the Blue Seats, Brian will deliver his boiling point for the week. Uh, boiling point. Boiling point this week. I have uh, April weather. It won't stop raining, and I'm tired of it. Why do I live here? Also, by extension, Comcast internet stinks. And I want to know why my Comcast bill is so high. I'm cutting the cord. I think I'm getting out of here, and I'm going to get some other internet. Jake. It's cost. It's costing me. It's making me crazy. It's it's. I like to keep it cool, especially around the kids. I'm starting to lose my mind. It, nothing works, and it doesn't stop raining. I'm sick of it. So, I just think ahead to a nice spring. Rangers in the playoffs. That gets me back to my zen. See the blue shirts. Hopefully, take a deep run. But man, right now I'm not happy. That's all I got. And that will wrap up episode 151 of Up in the Blue Seats, our Rangers podcast from the New York Post. All right, Brian, we've got our three stars. I'll go first. The UMass product, Jonathan Quick, the winningest American-born goaltender, and NHL history. That's an easy one. Probably the easiest one that I'll pick this season. (laughs) I'll let you have them because you went to UMass, even though he's never your teammate. Yeah. Um, I'll go Crides 300 Sparta. Um, <laughs> yeah, this guy has just been so consistent and he's found new ways to score goals, which I love. I love Crides. I love what he's, I love what he's done. I love that he's been there that long. He's stuck through it. There was rumors he was going to get traded. He's 300 goals, man. His, he's going to be the last guy to wear 20. I think for the New York Rangers. Oh, definitely. Congrats to him. 
Mm -hmm. That was a big one. And then our shared star, also an easy one. Oh, yeah. The the five guys on the ice last night. The gentlemen. Just throwing haymakers in Manhattan. Rempe, Goudreau, VC, Miller, and Truba. Way to go. Mayhem. Mayhem in Looking Manhattan. together. <laughs> Way it. to have each other's backs. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Good stuff. All righty. Thanks to Jake Brown for producing the show, along with Thomas Hogan. You guys can catch up on all episodes of the podcast by subscribing to Up in the Blue Seats on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also watch us on the New York Post Sports YouTube page. If you want to see Brian's pretty face, subscribe there. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube and comment below. How do you feel about the Rangers now with the playoffs just a few weeks away? And what did you think of the line brawl? You, uh, you liked it? You didn't like it? Let us know. You can also follow us on Twitter, me at, at Molly Walker, two E's, two R's, and at Brybrows22. For Brian Boyle, I'm Molly Walker. Thanks for listening and watching Up in the Blue Seats. Talk to you guys next week.